The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. What a blessing to gather together and worship our God. Well, I would like to welcome any visitors. We're grateful to have you come and worship with us this morning. We're greatly encouraged, uh, as Sean shared with the men of the vine, that we had an excellent uh, men's gathering, and the Lord did sweet things, and we're encouraged uh, with where that ministry will go. And then thank you to the deacons who put together the work day and just all that uh, was done yesterday. Grateful for all your service to the people. Um, I'm not very observant, and I noticed things to the building when I pulled in, so thank you so much. One quick announcement on Saturday, this Saturday, 5 o'clock at my house, we're going to do a study, and it's kind of like a think tank together on God's view of judging one another. I've got a, a dear brother, Christian Hunt, who's going to be going to seminary at Bethlehem as his trajectory. Um, the, he's going to teach on the subject that we've been kind of looking together, and what he's been uh, seeing in this has just been beautiful, and, and just we're going to wrestle together in the Scriptures to come out with the importance of loving one another in this area. It's so under attack in our culture today of what the Scriptures teach and how we need each other in this area, and it needs to be biblical and God Centered. So we'll have dinner at 5, and the study will start promptly at 6, and will last for a couple hours. And if it goes well, we're going to keep doing these little think tanks together, maybe the next time on social justice. And so no child care, but uh, there, will, there will be good uh, vittles. I think we'll have pizza together. Well, this morning we're going to take back up then in, in Peter. If you'll turn to 2 Peter, we're going to be looking at a new chapter this morning. We're going to start with chapter 3. This is the last chapter in this epistle. And just a, a beautiful chapter to draw our attention to the climactic end of history to this world as we know it. God will bring about His purposes for this world, why He designed it, and how He's going to end it and close it for all of eternity. The end for which He created the universe will come to pass. Nothing can thwart it or stop it. And so let me read our section this morning, and we'll ask God's blessing on our word, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets, and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all, that in the last day mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. And saying, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world in that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by this word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. May God add blessing to His Word. Father, we come before you, and as we look now at these words of Holy Scripture that you have inspired, Lord, we hold the words of God, and we are going to hear your words for how you will close up history, why you're working. I, I pray let every mind and heart be taken up with these truths. And I pray, Lord, that what you would do, what only you can do, and that you would uh, cause people to understand this and love Christ and long for his coming and be focused and set on it above all else. God, I thank you for this Christ. I thank you that he is holy, holy, holy. God, he is to be reverenced and praised and worshipped. We thank you for this, and it's in his name that we do pray. Amen. I want to give you your outline as we study these verses that I just read before you. In verses 1 through 2, we're going to remember the truth Peter calls us to. And then in verses 3 through 4, he's going to say, remember the false teachers, what they're going to come and sow in light of that truth. And then in verses 5 through 9, remember that we need to answer these false prophets and teachers 
with the truth. And so Peter's going to just show us how to do that this morning. So our first point in verses 1 through 2, we need to remember the truth. Flip back to just chapter 1, verse 12. <clears throat> Peter says, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, these great truths that he laid out in chapter 1. Even though you already know them and been established in the truth which is present with you, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you're going to be able to call these things to mind. I need to keep reminding you of these things so my imminent, my death is coming. I need you to be able to pull these to mind and heart. They're so anchored in your thinking, your heart, your hopes, and your desires that nothing can separate them from you. And so if you'll remember Peter's argument back into chapter 1, he said God has given precious promises from the sure word of God. And we looked at some of them. And we looked at the Mount Everest of those promises in verse 4 is that the gospel gives this koinonia fellowship with God. There's a gospel that can bring you back into relationship with God and stand in His presence blameless with great joy. The emphasis of that chapter, though, was on this climactic moment of the second coming where our koinonia will go through the roof, so to speak. He's going to come back and we're going to see Him and we're going to dwell with Him forever. All of eternity with the Lord. It will be so good. And as we hold these promises then near to our heart, Peter says you need to believe them. You need to trust in them. It's not enough to just know them and keep them distant from your life. They need to become the core and the driving realities of your life. And you need to keep them ever before us as the hope of the believer, which is chapter 3 of 2 Peter. They will flow into our lives and they will cause us to walk in righteousness. That is the only way to overcome the lusts of this world is with greater promises than what the world is promising. So what are the false teachers promising us? In chapter 2, they're promising us here and now, which is the message that has been in this world ever since the fall. Go for the gusto, get it right now, have it, have it right now. They're not focused on what will make them happy a million years from now. I just want to know what will make me happy in this instant. That's all I care about. And that's what they're going to hold out and give you promises. Go for it. Live for your flesh. Indulge right now. So what do false teachers have to do to us? The focus of chapter 2 is they have to convince you then that there's no judgment at the end of this life. You need to eat, drink, and be merry and just have fun and don't worry about the end. And these teachers are going to come and steal away any kind of judgment or accounting at the end of your life. There is no day of the Lord. He's not coming back. And that grace lets you live any way you want, and it really doesn't matter because it's all covered, and they'll preach licentiousness and tell you these lies. So false teachers want to take away the second coming of Jesus Christ because of its power and hope, or put it maybe in the background, or just not focus on it. True teachers tell you this is where you fix your hope. Peter said, therefore, fix your hope with finality on the coming to you grace of God. Settle it. Set it as your only hope. Your main hope is Jesus Christ coming back to this world. I thought of maybe an example of where what was going on in Peter's day in 2 Timothy 2.17. He's talking about these teachers and he says their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, <coughs> men who have gone astray from the truth. False teachers. And they're saying that the resurrection has already taken place. And thus they're upsetting the faith of some. And they're lying and they're stealing it and taking it away just like Peter's talking about. And so if you look with me at verse 1 then. This is now then, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you. The word beloved is going to be three times in this chapter. And it's from the root word agape. Agape love. Chapter 2 was some hard words, and last week we ended with some strong and difficult words that Peter laid out and uh, brought strongly to us. Now the shepherd takes his little flock, and he says, Now, beloved, beloved, beloved agape, my heart for you, is I want to stir your mind up then by way of reminder. Don't get away from these truths, beloved. 
What are the truths that Peter keeps reminding them of? Well, uh, in chapter 1, the first coming, he said, you've forgotten your purification of sins. You've forgotten the cross of Christ and that your sins are separated as far as from the east as from the west. You let that get away from you. And you need to remember that. And you've got to live into that and stay in it. And then the second thing is that he's coming again. And he's going to say, be holy and godly, knowing the Lord could come back at any moment. He's, uh, Paul wrote to Titus in chapter 2, the grace of God has appeared, Jesus, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly and righteously and godly in the present age. Second Peter, and you're looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us. Don't forget that that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These two comings are married together. They're the hope of the believer and they purify you and make you live holy and godly lives. You can't lose these things. Remember them, get them in, live into them. Just like people in Peter's day. How much more 2,000 years later do we need to be reminded again of where all of this is going and that we need to live in light of it. We are closer than we've ever been to the return of Christ. You should remember the words, he says in verse 1 then, of your holy prophets. And the holy prophets told us of both comings, first coming and second coming. He says you should remember the commandment of your Lord and Savior who spoke much about the second coming and the details and what to look for and when it will happen. Remember it. And then the apostles spoke some 300 times in the New Testament about the second coming of Jesus Christ. You need to remember these words of both Advents. You can forget this. So God says we need to remember. We have a ministry of remembrance with one another through this Word of God. And I was thinking, we like to celebrate Christmas and Easter, two of my favorite holidays. And I think Southside, we should make our own holiday that we celebrate and remember and focus and stir each other up on the second coming. You know, I guess, I don't know what, what to name it. Someone come up with a name and email me, okay? Just, let's pick a day, and it's always that just we, we, we eat what's different, not turkey or ham, we'll, we'll do something fun, and just focus on the second coming and make it a holiday here. Or maybe just everyone start greeting one another with Maranatha. Hey, Maranatha, may he come back today. We're all focused and looking at it. I can, it could do so much for the people of God when we remember this truth. Every problem you have this morning can be helped and encouraged if we keep our focus. He's coming back. Could be today. Oh, Jesus, Maranatha, come back. Secondly, our second point then is we need to remember the false teachers in verse 3. Knowing this, first of all, in the last day, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, of course, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, <coughs> all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. So know this, first of all, this Greek word means as a, a priority, as a, or a importance. And he says that in the last days, which is the time after the first advent, the first coming of Christ until his second coming, but the context here is in the last days of the last days. We're, we're getting close, okay? The mockers will come, and they're going to come with all of their mocking. And what are they, they going to mock? What are they going to do? They're going to mock your hope in the second coming of Jesus Christ, where believers have set their hope and they're looking for it, and they're going to come and make fun of you. You're silly. You're so naive. We've evolved. How can you still sit and believe in something silly like that? And they're going to mock those who are living Second Peter chapter 1, holy and godly and growing in it and looking for this blessed hope. Stroking to the boat of Christ's likeness. I'm all about it. I'm diligent. I'm making certain my calling. And they're communing and they're delighting in Christ and the full knowledge of Jesus and looking and learning of Him. And you're growing up like oaks who have moral excellence and self-control and perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and agape. You're just growing up into these kind of people. You'll be mocked for this. And maybe there's some of you here this morning that you are the ones who are mocking 
people who are diligent like this. I, I've been mocked by some even in this own church. You're, you're too serious about this. Those following Jesus as disciples, you're prudes. I've been preaching on the immorality of 2 Peter 2, saying the opposite of anything our culture is saying, and just telling you God wants you to be pure with your bodies till you get to glory. You're too serious. <laughs> Lighten up. Don't you understand your culture? You're just so focused on the second coming that you're not living and enjoying life. It's a mocker. Are you a mocker this morning? Why are they mockers? Because it says they, 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 they follow after their own lusts. They're, they're all about their own desires, their sensualities, all of these things. And they have to mock those who are putting salt on them and shining light. And so that they'll mock you and make fun of you and ridicule you because you're living the way Jesus has called you to live. They just want to live in the relative. And to say that the earth is going to end with an absolute and Jesus Christ coming back and making all things new is just complete foolishness to this generation. And they will mock you and they, they will live for their flesh. And so they have to get rid of a king who sees everything and knows everything and records everything and is coming again to judge the living and the dead. Uh, you, you, you can't get that out of your mind and your conscience. That's what God has said how this will end. And they've got to get rid of it. They've got to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. I can't deal with that. Those, those two don't go hand in glove. Sensuality and Jesus Christ coming back to make all things right. It doesn't work. So I've got to get rid of the truth. And then in verse 4, where, where are these promises? What, what's their argument? Their argument, where's the promise of a second coming? The world just keeps going on as it always has. My whole life, sun comes up, same things every day. There's no supernatural intervention. The laws of nature are constant, and they always have been for all of history. The sun comes up, the sun comes down, seasons come and go, the tides come up, the tides go out. It's the same thing every day, again and again. <laughs> We should not expect that anything different will ever happen. What is this thing that you guys are hoping in? That a sky is going to open up? The Lord of glory is going to return and a fiery judgment is ludicrous. Has this ever happened before is their argument. And this stuff has been all over the world for thousands of years and it continues to this day mockers for the blessed hope of the believers in Christ that purify us in this life, that it will be mocked. It has to be taken away. If, just, if you just want to live for your lust, greed, and pride of life, they'll never be able to be joined together, so we must remove them. So I want you this morning to remember the truth of both Advents to purify yourselves. And I want you to remember there's going to be false teachers who are going to come and, and mock and, and criti criticize you and laugh at you and now I want you to remember then, how do we answer these arguments? How do we answer the false teachers that start bringing these things and accusing uh, our hope? And so now we're going to look in verses 5 through 9 at this glorious answer. We have to take the truth of God's Word and hold it up to this uh, argument by the false teachers. And so can we answer it with the truth? Have they stumped us? Well, Peter's going to dismantle their argument in a threefold way and just destroy it. And he's going to leave you worshiping and loving the return of Jesus Christ this morning, taking their argument even deeper and showing the beauty of Jesus Christ. This is a beautiful answer by the fisherman, Peter the Rock. So let's look at this three-pronged answer that Peter's going to give to the false teacher. First, he gives an intellectual objection. <clears throat> look at verse 5. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water and by the water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Look at the earth. It just goes on and on for eons and eons. And logically, this has continued forever and it will go on forever until it all melts one day back into the sun. And so the argument is I cannot accept intellectually a judgment day. And Peter's answer is brilliant. Your real problem, then, he says, is with creation day. 
Was the universe created by a creator? Or just some blind forces that exploded and came into being and the world is just perfect as we know it by some crazy explosion? Is this world just an accident? If so, then Peter's going to say history is meaningless. All just die and rot and the universe one day will just burn up into the sun. Nothing you do makes a hill of beans of difference. Right and wrong do not matter then. So a judgment day then makes no sense. You can reject it, but history means nothing then. How you live this morning then doesn't even matter if you embrace that. Life is absolutely meaningless if you hold to that. Creation and judgment day, Peter is saying, are inextricably tied together. Some heavy philosophy from a fisherman. If this earth was created... Everything demands that a creator can judge it. And the creator has a design and a purpose and a blueprint, and the two are are linked together. And look at Peter's argument in verse 5. This is in 6 and 7. He he, he comes down and he says, realize this. By the same word in verse 5, God created. And then in verse 6, he says, by the exact same word, a flood came upon the world and flooded it. And then in verse 7, by the same word, there's fire and destruction that will come at the end of this earth and purify it and burn it up. And so the intellectual objection then uh, is is that the the two are tied together. And now in verse 8, he gives us a time objection. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. It has been so long, where is he? Where is he? That's Peter's day. How about 2,000 years later? Where is he? Really, pastor, come on. What is to be our response to this mocking? Where is it? 2,000 years, buddy. (laughs) I don't see it. Maybe your own hearts are secretly struggling even with this as you sit here this morning. Yeah, yeah. It's been 2,000 years. What, where is it? And Peter's response is so sweet. The way that God views the world and all of its unfolding, it hasn't been long to him at all. God is outside of time, and yet he fills it. He's eternal. He's always existed forever. And so God is weaving this amazing, glorious plan called redemptive history to set His glory on display. And I want you to hear this this morning. He is never bored. God is not bored like some of you look this morning. He's not bored ever with this unfolding of His glorious, beautiful plan. 2,000 years is like two days to God, the eternal one, not bound by time. We're just such time people. We were created in it. We live in it. And it really, it drives everything in America. Most of our lives are just time frames. I got to get to this. I got to look at my watch. I got to look at my phone. And, and so why is God waiting so long in my life? I've been praying for two months and he hasn't changed it. And we, we all live in time and we're always struggling and thinking God should act in my time frame, my timeline. And we lose sight of what Peter is saying. In verse 9, the Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness. God is not slow about keeping His promise of His second coming. Slowness is just relative to your perspective, right? I remember as a kid, when we'd be on a long car drive, you know, when are we going to get to the hotel with the swim pool? In two hours, son. That's forever. I'll be dead by the time we get to the Ramada Inn. When my wife was pregnant with our first child, nine months seemed like forever. Anyone pregnant? (laughs) It's forever. As a dad, I just sat at my baby's graduation from high school and tears were welling up, just thinking that was the fastest 18 years of my life. It seemed like yesterday when the nurse handed me that sweet little girl and she was wrapped up like a little burrito in this uh, <laughs> blanket. It looked like Chipotle. And, and all I could think of is God's perspective 
on 2,000 years is like two days. It's his joy in unfolding this plan. I was, I was thinking of joy even with time. Is that there's times like when you're listening to a sermon, and, and it can seem like forever sometimes, if, especially long introductions. But then, when I, when I went to Yellowstone with my wife for a week, uh, at the end of the week, it's like, what, it's over already? You know, it just went so fast. And so what I'm looking at here is that God delights in his plan of redemption. He has joy over what he's doing. And he's not wringing his hands going, when is history going to be over? It's so long. God is so happy in what he's doing that a thousand years are like a day to him. So beautiful. The intellectual objection, the time objection, Peter, just matters. And now I want to look at the misunderstanding objection in, in uh, verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promises, some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. I hope that you had breakfast so that your minds are working because this verse has got some tricky things and I, I, we got to tackle them. We're not going to get into it exhaustively, but I need you to really think with me for the blessing that is in this verse. We count 2,000 years as slowness. We all want them to come back right now. And the injustice of this world, isn't it killing you? To just keep looking out day after day because we, we get to see the whole world now and we get to see the things that go on all over this world and the abortions and genocide and the wars and sex trafficking and the strong abusing the weak and the racism and all the stuff that goes on on a daily basis. Your, your heart's just like, come back. Please, Lord, why are you waiting? Why do you let this keep going on? Return this hour and let justice roll like a mighty river and make everything right in this universe that's so broken. Let righteousness reign on earth. Can't wait for that. How long, oh Lord, how long will you wait? There's a beauty to that desire. I love it. Don't lose that. It's part of like kingdom come. But just think through this one thought. If Jesus would have came back 50 years ago, show of hands how many have been saved in the last 50 years. Get them up high. This is, this is doing something for pastor. Okay. Because 50 years ago, there were believers hastening his coming and praying, come back. God, return. And what would have happened to all those hands right there? Especially if you were born and you weren't saved. We, we would have died without Jesus Christ. We'd perish. And so I want you to listen why God is delaying. When, when we can't be patient. There's, there's a patience in God who is delaying for a very specific reason and a very specific purpose. And so I just want to kind of maybe give you a bird's eye view of what Peter's talking about. In Romans 11, Paul said, I don't want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. Why? Until a fullness of the Gentiles have come in. There's a, there's a fullness of the Gentiles that need to come into the kingdom of God that he's building. And so the Jews have been hardened for this season for the Gentiles to come in. 1 Peter 2, when we studied it, he's, he's building a spiritual house. And every time he saves someone, you're a stone in the temple of God. And there's still stones that he's taking to finish building his temple. The bride of Christ. When the last one is brought in and we are made spotless, we will then be presented to the bridegroom. God is gathering his people, his elect, from every tribe, tongue, and nation, race, throughout the history of the world until all of His own are gathered together. Christ will not return a day earlier or a day later until all of His chickens are brought in. Until He brings them all under His wing safely. So what I'd like to do then is kind of narrow down then in our text. 
And this is one of those verses that there has been so much controversy over the years in the church of God if this text is not properly understood. And it's, again, it's that razor's edge and you can fall off on either side. And some people don't like to think about this, but you've you got to answer this because it's in your Bible and you need to have a right view of God and what He's doing. And so I won't get lost in it, but I don't want to lose the context and the flow of what Peter is saying, but enough here that I want to take a shot at it. <clears throat> when I preached through uh, uh, Matthew, the Lord's Prayer, we, we spent a whole Sunday on this, so I want to refer you back to Thy will be done and the Lord's Prayer. But when we looked at it, God is such a complex being that it shouldn't surprise you that it's not just simple, that there's just one little aspect to God's will. It should blow you away that there, there, there's three aspects that the Scriptures reveal when we're trying to understand and consider the will of God. And I'm going to go over those three and then we'll get back into our context. But first is the decreed will of God. Isaiah, he's planned the end from the beginning. God brings to pass whatever he decrees. It cannot be thwarted. No one can resist his will. This is why we can trust God. This is why the, the believer has so much rest as there's a God who's decreed my life from beginning to end to get the most glory out of it and for my good and being shaped to the image of Jesus Christ. It's great news. Don't take God off his throne and pull it away. One of the greatest news is that God reigns. Jehovah reigneth. And he's decreed the end from the beginning. And I can rest in it and nothing can thwart that will. But how do I know what that will is? I don't know till it happens. Okay? I didn't know I was supposed to marry Laura Murphy until I stood on an altar and said, I do. Decreed will of God. And don't come, I have guys come to me later and say, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I'm going to divorce my wife because it, it wasn't God's will. Liar. It was God's will. It was his will the minute you say, I do. And so the decree of God always happens. It can never be thwarted. It's why we trust our God. But secondly, the scriptures show us another aspect of God's will called the revealed will of God. And that is as simple as I'll call it the Bible. And God has revealed himself in his scriptures. And now he tells us what he desires of us. What is good, O oh man, and what God desires of you? And so here it is. I, I come to the scriptures and when I was looking for a wife, oh God, what should I look for in a wife? Well, I have his revealed will to start seeing what a godly woman should look like and what I should choose in a wife. So I'm looking at the revealed will of God. I don't know what his decree is. She could have said, no. Thank you, Jesus. She said, yes. <laughs> That's the decreed and revealed will of God. It's how we seek to live. And I want you to hear this. It can be resisted. And most often it is. We have a world that is resisting this will of God on a daily basis, and yet they're not resisting the decree of God. God is unfolding His universe perfectly for the glorifying of His Son at the end of the ages. Thirdly, then, he talks about the desires of God. <clears throat> These are things that God tells us please Him. Psalm 147 says, The Lord delights in those who fear Him, on those who wait for His loving kindness." Proverbs 15, 8, it says, prayer pleases God. And so on and so on. We see the desires of God that will be revealed in Scripture. And I'll tell you this, sometimes God desires something that He does not decree. And He desires that we would all live faithful and obedient to Him. And yet He has not decreed because even sin is being used in our sanctification. So these are deep, big theological things, but if you don't understand this, you're, you're going to miss. If you just think the will of God is this one aspect, you, you'll, you'll shipwreck. And so we need to look how God reveals himself in Scripture with all three of these. So God has decreed who he would save and who he would not in Romans 9. He has passive decrees and, and active decrees where he, he actively saves his people and he passively lets those go their own merry way. But never, never, and I'm passionate about this, never take the heart out of God and become the frozen chosen. That God has no desire, no care. He's just some cosmic killjoy delighting and throwing people into hell. That's just a lie. That is such a bad interpretation of this Bible. It'll take the heart out of you. I've, I've been there and I've watched it. You start thinking of God that way and you'll lose your heart for people. 
and it'll make you a cold, staunchy, raunchy, Calvinist hyper. That's what it'll do to you. And you'll say, oh, I just love that God gets glory and those who go to hell. Stop! Ezekiel says that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So I'll ask you this, which aspect of God's will is Peter talking about this morning in our text? Is it his decreed will? Because if it is, it's a universalism, then all will be saved if that's what he's talking about. Is it his revealed will, not making a commandment here for men not to perish? Uh, that no one holds to that view. I couldn't find anyone that would hold that. So is it the desires of God's heart? And that God's desire is not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. As Sean Killian, our pastor, read this morning, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I just wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Thank your Lord for His beautiful heart. And I desire to have the same heart of God. That I desire the salvation of every single soul in this world. And I'm not prejudiced. I'm not like Jonah who didn't, who didn't want to go tell the Ninevites. A greater Jonah has come who loves the nations. It says, go to the nations. I desire that all men repent. I want none to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Has Christ given you that heart? Raunchy Calvinist? Has God given you that heart? Or has your theology, a wrong understanding of Scripture, just ripped that out of you and you sit here smug? There's a greater Jonah. Thomas Schreiner a great commentator writer from uh, Southern Seminary, said God genuinely desires in one sense that all will be saved, even if He did not ultimately decree that all will be saved. The desire and heart of God. And so this is a call that as God delays to trust His compassion and His love and His desire for these ones to come to repentance. Don't count it as slowness. Don't just sit there, oh, God's slow. Right? Don't do that. Praise God for His merciful delay and how many of us have drank from that fountain because He delayed. May we be all about this. Wake up. Have the heart of God. I'm going to quote for joy John Calvin for you hyper-Calvinists. I'm going to bring your own guy into come in here, speak, John. I want you to hear from him. John says that not willing that any should perish, so wonderful is his love towards mankind that he would have them all to be saved. And it is of his own prepared, uh, his own self prepared to bestow salvation on the lost. But the order is to be noticed. That God is ready to receive all to repentance so that none may perish. For in these words, the way and manner of obtaining salvation is pointed out. You need to repent. Every one of us, therefore, who is desirous of salvation, if that's you this morning, you must learn to enter in His way. But it may be asked, if God wished for none to perish, why do so many perish? And to this my answer is, that no mention is here made of the hidden purpose of God. It's not in this text, according to which the reprobate are doomed to their own ruin, but only His will as made known to us in the gospel, the heart of God, His desires. For God there stretches forth His hand without a difference to all, but, lay hold, but lays hold of those to lead them to Himself, whom he has chosen before the foundation of the world. And one more quote by Thomas Schreiner. We should not retreat to God's decreed will to nullify and negate what this text says. And many will run to it and just say, all, all this is talking about is his elect, that's it. 
nor should we use this verse to cancel out God's ordained will. Better to live with the tension and the mystery of this text than to swallow it up in a philosophical system that pretends to understand all of God's ways. Quit being prideful. God's patience and His love are not illusions, but neither do they remove His sovereignty. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder, that He desires that all would come to repentance and that He will bring and call His elect to Himself. Hold them together. Get into your community groups this week and have fun. (laughs) Okay? Dive in. Get this. Wrestle with it. You need to understand it. So let's pull back out And I'm going to close out with a bird's eye view. (coughs) False teachers and mockers, they try to get us away from the righteousness of Christ by other promises, the promises of your flesh. And God is being patient toward these people desiring for all to come to repentance. How merciful is that? But the time that God is giving for repentance... The false teachers are turning it into an argument for why you don't need to repent and just enjoy sin. Do you see the depravity of man? The kindness of God. I'm giving you time to repent. And false teachers are saying, see, you can sin and get away with it. God doesn't care. You're just abusing the mercy and kindness of God in delaying so you would come to Christ and be saved. Depravity of man. And so guys, God's patience is lasting but it's not everlasting. It will come to an end and there will be a day when He will come and He'll take that ark and it will be closed and you'll knock on it and He'll say, away from me, I never knew you. There's a day. His patience is not that He doesn't care. It's that His power is holding back the judgment and the wrath against sin that's going to come on that last day. And so it's not that He doesn't matter. It's that His power is holding according to His decree of of all that would come to repentance until that day when He will finally unleash for all of eternity. The patience of God is to bring us to repentance, not to make us think we can sin and God doesn't care. I pray there's no one in this room buying that lie when He comes back and you see Him and it's too late to repent. What a sin to abuse the time that God has given you to repent. I pray there's not one soul in here this morning abusing this patience. This is time to repent and turn to the living God. It's not time to live for your lusts and your pleasures and the pride of life. and Shake your fist at God and say, oh, when's He going to come back? Those religious folks are so pathetic. This time will come to an end and nobody knows when except the Lord. And this kindness is so that you would repent. Turn to this God and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Come, to this Christ. He's given you another day to repent. Stop fighting Him and fighting life and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and brought into safety in the presence of Christ. I pray there be none who would abuse this kindness of delay. So what I want to close with is sometimes the doctrine of the day of the Lord, uh, judgment day, can take the saints down hard because of their tender hearts and their consciences. And so as we close out, I want the day of the Lord to not be a downer. I want it to be the greatest hope of the believer that you are waiting for. Because here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about Judgment Day. When He comes, who's going to pass through it? Who's going to stand in His presence blameless with great joy and get through Judgment Day into eternal glory? Is it the ones with a good record? Nice squeaky clean moral people what is this verse telling us he wants all to repent all to repent and turn to jesus christ and be saved he's commanding all men everywhere the creator of the universe repent turn to the living god this is not bad news what this is telling us is that the ones who will stand on the last day of judgment are not the squeaky, moral, religious, good guys. It will not be the top moral people in our country. No. But it's the ones who know they're no good. Paul says there's none good, no, not even one. It's the ones who are finally convinced that all your good works are a filthy rag before this God. 
There's no goodness in anything you've ever done in light of who this God is. And these ones, who are white, hot sinners, are the ones who are broken over their sin before this God. And they're the ones who will repent and turn to this Christ as the only remedy that God has ever given for the healing of our sins. To have them washed and cleansed and made as white as snow before this God. To have your sins forgiven. In our day, it's the moral who think they're going to stand. I'm the best. Of the, I'm the only one in my family who's not a mess. All are fooling around at work on their spouses except me. I have never done drugs. Guys, it is not the good who will stand before this God in judgment. You will be swept away, good guy. It's not the ones who have done the most, but the ones who know the most of what God has done for them in Christ Jesus. If you stand before God in your own record, you will be cast away. And if you repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll stand before this God in Jesus' record of perfection. This very day, I want you to look at Jesus being judged by God on a cross so you wouldn't have to be. Him bearing the wrath of God so you would never know a drop of it. I take you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior, and I will pass through the judgment seat. I can stand in judgment because Jesus stood in my judgment. Repent. That's the message this morning. Repent. And please see that the worst news in all the world would be if God says, I don't want you to perish. I want you to be the best version of you. And then you, you can just be the best one you can be. That would be the saddest message there is. But the best news is to repent as filthy sinners before this God and come to Christ and be washed and cleansed and wrapped in His righteousness and be accepted with this God. So last thought. Don't use the time of God being patient for a reason to sin. Some of you are sitting here guilty of that this morning. But rather, engage in God's purpose for why He's delaying. Why is He delaying? To go after all the nations, all the peoples of this world, that they might repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why God is delaying for yuppies, millennials, street people, derelicts, different cultures, different religions, militant and pacifists, male and female, all peoples, that they would repent. Because God has sheep that are not of His fold. We want to give our lives to gather them in. And so I need my heart to be joined with God's heart He's delaying. And not so I can get my pajamas and sit on the rooftop, but so that I would give my life for the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so I pray that every heart this morning would look at this patience of God and marvel that it brought you into the kingdom, that He was patient. And just say, all I want to do with my life is to have the heart of God and, and get in this world to bring others to the sweet Christ before that last day comes when the day of the Lord will come upon us like a thief in a night we'll look at next week. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, I thank you for this glorious passage. I thank you for the answer we have to the false prophets, the false teachers. I thank you that we're not fools to follow Jesus Christ. I thank you for such a gospel that it's not for the good guys, but it's for sinners. Thank you, Lord, you came not, to, not for, the, the, for the healthy, but the sick. That's us. I thank you, Lord, that you opened our eyes to see our righteousness is like a filthy rag before our God. And I thank you that you opened our eyes to Christ's righteousness and to him as a remedy for sin, that we could be reconciled to our God. So, Lord, I, I feel like your ambassador now, begging and urging that everyone in this room would be reconciled to God. Lord, let them hear your voice calling them now. Come to Christ. All who are weary and heavy laden, that they might have life. God, save any. Don't let the, the, the delay harden them. 
But next week we'll see, let all of us be about holiness and godliness in light of this sure return of Jesus Christ. Lord, give us your heart. Don't let us be like Jonah. Let us be like the greater Jonah and have a heart for the nations. Lord, I thank you. It's in Christ's name that we do pray. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. And we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.